Now that we have explored a little bit of what inverse functions are, let's take a look at the graphs of functions with their inverses. In the example that we see here, in red, we have the inverse graph of f. In blue, we have the original f of x function. What we see here is that a function's graph, when compared to its inverses graph, they're going to be reflections across the line y equals x. So if you put your screen on the side or just tilt your head to the right, you'll see that the y equals x line is serving as our mirror. That's the line of reflection. Here we have the original f of x graph, and reflected on the other side of that y equals x line is the graph of its inverse. How are reflections created across the line y equals x? It's actually quite simple. For the original function, all those xy pairs will be reflected across that line to create its inverse graph by basically swapping the x and the y coordinates. You see that here, the ordered paired a comma b in the original graph of f becomes the ordered pair b comma a in the graph of its inverse. Because x and y are essentially swapping roles, so do the domain and range. The domain for the original function f will become the range for the inverse. And the range of the original function f will become the domain of its inverse. Let's take a look at the following example. It's asking us to graph f of x is equal to the square root of the quantity x plus 2. Well, here, the parent function is our square root function. And we see one transformation. We would have to move the graph two units to the left. So the original square root function would have started at 0, 0, and then branched off into the first quadrant. But because we're moving everything to the left two units, then we've got to make the appropriate adjustments. Let me get one more point in here so that we have a good guide. So here is the graph of f of x. Now to create the graph of its inverse, I'm going to add in the line of reflection, which is the y equals x line. The y equals x line goes through the origin with a slope of positive 1. So it'll look just like this. Now, I'm going to reflect on the other side of this mirror. So let's start here with the ordered pair, negative 2, comma, 0. Its reflection will be at the ordered pair, 0, comma, negative 2. Basically, we're swapping the x and the y coordinates. Let's look at the next ordered pair at 2, comma, 2. Well, because the x and the y coordinates are identical, then swapping them isn't going to make a difference. That point is going to stay put. In fact, that's true because that point is on the mirror itself, so there is no reflection. Finally, let's look at the ordered pair 7, comma, 3 in the original graph of f. That is going to be reflected to the point 3, comma, 7. And so the graph of the inverse is going to be right here in red. The domain for the original f function includes values from negative 2 through positive infinity. The range starts at 0 with no upper bound. Again, we're looking at the blue graph. The domain of its inverse will be the same as the range of the original function. And you should be able to verify this by looking at the red graph. The lowest x value on the graph is 0, and it'll continue traveling to the right without bound. 
The range for the inverse is the domain of the original function. Therefore, we're going from negative 2 with no upper limit. And again, you can verify this from the graph because the red graph has a lowest y value at negative 2 with no maximum value. Now let's look at the procedure for finding the rule for the inverse function when we have the rule for the original function f. Here are the four steps to follow. First, you're going to replace the notation f of x with the letter y. After all, they are synonymous. Next, we're going to change x and y, meaning where you see an x, you put a y, where you see a y, you put an x. This is where the two variables swap roles. Third, we're going to isolate the new y variable. So we're going to solve for the new y variable. Finally, once you have y isolated, we're going to replace y with the new notation of f inverse. Let's go through that with these two examples. First, we have f of x is equal to 2x minus 3. Step one is that we're going to replace the f of x label with the letter y. Next, we're going to interchange x and y. So where I see x, we're going to put y. Where I see y, you're going to put x. This is where x and y swap roles. Next, I'm going to isolate the new y variable. I'm going to start by adding 3 to both sides. Next, I'm going to divide both sides by 2. And I'm going to clean this up a little bit and swap sides just to make it look a little cleaner. So I'm going to write this as y is equal to 1 half x plus 3 halves. This is the equation of the line written in slope-intercept form. Finally, I'm going to replace y with the new f inverse notation. The original line was uh, had a positive slope of 2. Its inverse is going to have a slope of 1 half. I encourage you to take time to graph these two lines to see that they are reflections of each other across the y equals x line. Here's our next example. f of x is equal to the cubic root of 6x minus 7. First, we replace the f of x notation with the letter y. Next, we're going to swap the x and the y variables. Next, we're going to isolate the y variable. Right now, this y is embedded inside that cubic root. So we're going to cube both sides. In cubing the right side, the radicand gets liberated, so we just end up with 6y minus 7. Let's add 7 to both sides. Divide both sides by 6. And again, let's just write this in a little bit more of a clean way. y equals 1 sixth x cubed plus 7 over 6. And finally, replace y with the new f inverse notation. Now because this does not represent a line, I think we are perfectly fine leaving it in fraction form. In fact, I think I prefer it now that I see it in writing. So here is the rule for f inverse.